to say in my presentation and on the basis of my speech is going to dwell around the uh, fact that I met Honkish twice. The first one was when I was very young. I was studying at a technocratic university, writing my professorship, uh, di diploma work professorship, and I uh, got hold of the Hankish's book, The Pitfalls or the, the Trapfalls of uh, Society. I was a graduate from the Faculty of Economics and we heard about the game theory, but it was uh, a bit distant, really, what Hankish was trying to say. But then I understood what he was trying to say. That must have been at, the, at around 1983-84. I also read a few other articles from him, and then I became a head of the department, and I had to define what I would like to do. And I realized I don't want to well, go on in the same in the footsteps of my predecessors. Um, I was a natural scientist myself, and I showed how the nuclear reactors were working, and we modeled it in different ways. And I said that the greatest possible accident that might happen is that then we we don't we don't have power. I mean electricity. It seemed impossible that the moderator uh, goes out, the reactor stops down, and then it was impossible to have an accident. But in 1986, when Chernobyl happened, I was. I happened to be on board of an airplane coming from Moscow over the area, and I, we were not told how hazardous uh, uh, it was. And, have detrimental to health, and I started to read about uh, natural, the management of natural resources uh, and other um, ideas in, in Western journals, and I read another good thing, that was Hankish's book, and I realized that I should really go beyond the kind of borderline so that I can deal with our environment and, and to understand the principle of sustainability, I needed to go across the border between disciplines. So I was a chemist with all kinds of epoxy um, materials and everything. And, and I realized that we simply don't understand why people don't want to have switch systems and incinerators and dumping sites. Why don't, why don't people want a nuclear power station? Why don't people want a water uh, uh, dam? So there were lots of things, and the answers were more or less provided by Honkish. And I'm sure that some people will talk about the individual trapfuls and we can see the re roots and the origins. When I was writing my book, I put down the original claims with the references, and I described these these traps and pitfalls. Well, it was obvious that we should do something about the society so that people start uh, talking about these problems. Well, without the society, without the involvement of the people, it seems it seemed impossible. It was also quite clear that there are these interdisciplinary or disciplinary borders which are very difficult to penetrate or to go beyond, but it seemed obvious that the University of Technology and, and the University of Economics might be able to cooperate. I attended both universities, so I understood what the problem might be. When I visited the, uh, the faculty of um, natural sciences, well, I got up at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then uh, I finished at 8 o'clock in the evening. And my former roommates are actually ended up in big positions. And my well, philologist friends were already coming back from the pub by the time I got home. And I basically helped, Hankish help, helped me understand why these big differences. Uh, were there, and he was trying to prove this, that these traps exist experimentally. 
and actually they, they put uh, experimentally they put a garbage bin in the middle of the road and there was a hero and it turned out it was not a hero it was a thief because he basically nicked this garbage bin and Hankish had fantastic uh, um, ingenious ideas as to how to experiment with people and the next meeting I had with Hankish it was here and he was describing the scenarios especially three ones that might be interesting to look at he described these scenarios and then added another column this this third column is his edition and it says uh, how you relate to death how people relate to death when I first met him he was young and when what I didn't like about social sciences, it was, you know, asking, conducting questionnaires and surveys and everything. They asked me something that we all knew. And then we answered something, uh, we explained something that we already knew. So th I, I, was, I didn't believe in such things. I have been involved in OECD questionnaires, uh, spending a lot of money and asking a few thousand people. And then we realized that for people uh, worth 100,000 foreigns that we improve the water quality of Blake Balaton. So these kind of issues, we got the same answers all the time. And I was happy to see that Hankish had enough to Not because it was not an interesting thing, but it was boring and it was too much. We, it's very clear that we have a hypothesis and then in the question the answer is already embedded, it's quite obvious. So he finished this and Hankish did not end up as an academician and another good friend of mine, Joska Kinder, did not become one either. Uh, but he achieved something that he helped me go beyond this border and start be being active in another field, in another discipline. I think it's a big thing. Uh, Hankish had messages, clear messages, that he wanted to convey. And if you look at the scenarios on this slide, it's very frightening to see that he could sum up the main point in just one sentence. There is, for instance, a, a harassed neighborhood if you look at actually at the, the second scenario and he wrote this before actually we ever had to go through this he says we should defend the western civilization against the barbarians now this is like a prognosis um, there is another one like somebody likes the, the, the modest melancholy of uh, countryside cemeteries. So what did he look at? He looked at things, and this is where I would like to relate to education. The question was, what should we teach? How should we train the trainer, and how should we train the students? so that they can pick from these scenarios, or maybe how could they combine these scenarios, obviously, individually in a sterile manner, none of them could be accepted. But how could people be prepared to pick an adequate scenario? I would like to uh, go back to the previous presentation and the, one of the greatest messages conveyed by the Industrial Revolution was that we have about 15 years, 20 years until which we can believe that we should satisfy uh, the uh, demands of an industry which is a client, so it makes us believe that this is the utmost of utmost importance. The robots will be able to do that, obviously, but tacit knowledge will, can be solved with intelligence. So what shall we do with people to prevent them from being bored to death? Well, according to Hankish, and Sidovsky says the same, that we should teach the people to be intelligent so that they will be able to spend time wisely spend time in a way that they feel happy, find themselves an activity which 
uh, focus on soft things, they can enjoy literature, they can ac accept and, and appreciate art. Uh, the robot that is in the center of our universe now, well, we will not, we will not need this robot. How much time do we have for this and how many billions of people will be involved in this? I don't know. What shall we do with the four billion people who are illiterate, otherwise they will become barbarians and vandals. But we will have to find ourselves and we will have to work out our communities. These are quotes from Hankish. And education is about competition nowadays, and we are force, forcing our children to climb a tree, uh, the elephant should climb the tree, uh, the monkey should climb the tree, everybody should climb the tree, and this is simply unsustainable. We need to change something in our system. This is we, we really have to alter and find a system which relies on the capacities and abilities of pay people so that they can find the most adequate activity for themselves. The interesting thing is that uh, people should experience some kind of safety, freedom, and the hope that their life is worthwhile. And this is a message that Hankish wanted to convey. I didn't know what I found so amazing about Hankish. Any time he started talking, he was like, he, he always impressed me, and I just didn't know why. And I'm old enough, you know, to experience situations when somebody starts speaking and I just switch off, you know, I just doze off immediately. But when Hankish spoke, I never did, and I just didn't know why. And when I met him in person, and we had the opportunity to talk and have a more intimate relationship, not just, you know, being uh, distant colleagues, I realized, reading the quotations, is that he, he uses terms and phrases that not many scientists use. Uh, my, for instance, means fuzziness, fragment, um, fragmented, um, dim, and I realized that these words sound somewhat familiar to me. So I went to see uh, Paul Apostle's hymn of love, and I realized that the, uh, he uses the same words, the fragments, the fragments, the I was thinking like a child, I could see through fuzzy, a fuzzy prism. So it's the same words recurring. So these are the words of the Apostle, and you can see the words. So what, what was unique and special about Elamir was this was overall love. Uh, towards humanity and towards us and, and a great deal of understanding and a great deal of sense of responsibility towards the world that he thought we should reinvent.